come to the last uh, session. Livin Bouvet, Dr. Livin Bouvet, is a professor of theology in the Faculty of Theology and Religious Studies in the Catholic University in Louvain, and at the same time is Director General of the, in the Flemish Catholic Education Office. I want to say this about Levin before he tells us himself how good he is. In, <laughs> in my view, for perhaps about 30 years, Levin has been the prime interpreter of that space between uh, society, church, and academy. The very space that we have been speaking about more or less at this conference, and also the space that we who've worked in the Loyola Institute over the last 10 years have been exploring. Uh, his work is a leading work in that, um, particularly in Europe. And it's a real good happens chance that the last speaker at this conference would be Dr. Bouvet. You're very welcome. What can I say after having been introduced <laughs> in such a way? So thank you for inviting me. Um, I apologize also that I could not be here yesterday and that I missed all those fine talks. But at least uh, it gives me also the opportunity to think that I will say also something new after so many people have said already so many things about uh, theology. Um, because I know I'm the last speaker, I also prepared the PowerPoint. So if you fall asleep, <laughs> that you can, in one way or another, whenever opening your eyes, that you, that you see where we, where we are. And I'm the uh, last, uh, you know, still two little remarks. So I have to change my title after Massimo's uh, paper this morning. So it's Recontextualizing Theology at the University in Europe. Okay, not in the United States. <laughs> and then the, the last one is uh, yeah, for, uh, for Michael. So it, my, my paper, Michael, is a, a, a twin paper to yours, but it's a non-identical twin <laughs> a paper to yours. And it's up to you in the discussion afterwards. We can discuss about the identical, non-identical thing with the paper of Michael. Okay, good. So... Um, some 10, 15 years ago, I have been challenged many times to think about theology. Uh, I was dean of the faculty in, in Leuven, um, but also uh, president of the European Society for Catholic Theology. And uh, then I came up with, a, with an analysis, which I presented quite some time. I published it also in, uh, in 2014 in Dutch. And um, what I wanted to do today is to see whether my analysis of then whether it still fits, whether things have changed in the university, in the church, in, the, in society, so that I would have to revise my, my original thesis. Um, so in my analysis and further reflection, I first described theology's ongoing marginalization, after which I advocated for a theology which uh, a theology which, uh, what was it again? Yeah, rather than being defensive or reactionary, deals without resentment with this marginalization. A theology which, from the margins, self confidently stands at the crossroads of university, church, and society, in dialogue with each of them. A resilient theology, therefore, which is acutely aware of its current location and seizes it as an opportunity to recontextualize itself. In the meantime, it would seem that the time has come to engage in a re-evaluation of my analysis of a decade ago. In all three of the domains, changes have, hap ha have happened which might lead us to further refining or even revisiting of my initial analysis and conclusions. Just to name some of these evolutions, in the university, a more pragmatic, but also economic understanding of the academic enterprise have gained even more ground than before. 
while at the same time counter reactions pleading for the idea of, of universitas in research, education and service to society more frequently pop up. In the church, the election of Pope Francis to the Papal See has considerably changed the attitude of the church towards the academy and culture and society, from a rather defensive and countercultural stance to a critical, constructive, prophetical position. And in culture and society, the middle ground where the different political ideological opinions could meet seems to have vanished almost completely, leading to the crisis of classical political parties and positions and much more popularity for the extremes. More than ever, identity politics seems to rule, leading first of all to polarization, but secondly also to insecurity and loss of meaning. It is the observation of many that the COVID-19 pandemic in this regard has not caused this crisis of insecurity and loss of meaning, but has certainly aggravated it, or at least made it more visible. Also, the war in Ukraine should be discussed when dealing with theology's role in society. As to my current work, so as the uh, Director General of the Office for Catholic Education in Flanders, it's an assignment which I currently also combine with my assignment in, in Leuven. Uh, it's good to know that at the Office of Catholic Education in Flanders, it's a network organization which represents more than 2,400 Catholic schools, from kindergarten, nursery until adult and higher education, representing up to 60% of the primary schools in Flanders and 70% of secondary schools. So apart from designing and implementing more adequate governing procedures for our schools, I was specifically tasked with developing a vision and a plan to reconfiguring their Catholic identity, especially in relation to the highly detraditionalized and pluralized Flemish context. Just to, to put it in a nutshell, 70% of all pupils in secondary school go to a Catholic school, only 1% or less than 1% goes regularly to mass. Okay, that's the situation. Yeah. So how to, to deal with Catholic identity in this situation? This has led me to the development of the project of the Catholic Dialogue School. And as far as I'm concerned, this constituted a challenge to test some of my theological intuitions into real practice. As a matter of fact, that's also the way how the bishops uh, could convince me to take the job. They said to me, well, you have had the luxury to think for 20 years, now work a little. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Um, so before engaging this uh, re-evaluation of my uh, uh, initial analysis, three caveats. Um, first, when I speak of theology, it's Catholic theology. The church is the Catholic church. But mutatis mutandis, I think uh, a lot of what I say can uh, be translated uh, for theologies or other denominations. Secondly, what I say is uh, influenced greatly by developments in my own Flemish context and the various ways in which uh, my own and neighboring faculties of theology and universities in, uh, in, in the countries around Belgium react to these. And thirdly, uh, yeah, a lot of what I say, the arguments, the intuitions, the thinking patterns draw from uh, the theology of interruption which I developed over the years and to which I refer for further discussion. And a major underlying insight of this theology is that there is an intrinsic link between faith and tradition on the one hand and history and context on the other. As a result, contextual novelty puts pressure on historically conditioned expressions of faith and their theological understanding thus driving theology towards recontextualization. Contextual sensitivities and thought patterns start shifting. Older forms of tradition lose their familiarity and plausibility, and effects of alienation often arise. Theologians then find themselves in the middle of a search for a new relationship between the transmitted faith tradition and the changing contemporary context. As a descriptive category, Recontextualization assists by analyzing the ways in which tradition has been challenged by contextual change and novelty. Historically speaking, then, reactions have varied from stubborn condemnation and suppression of this novelty 
as an attempt to uphold the tradition uncontaminated, to the uncritical embracing of and adaptation to cultural newness at the risk of watering down the tradition's specificity. As a normative category, recontextualization calls for a theological program whereby the insight into the intrinsic link between faith and context urges theologians to take the contextual challenges seriously in order to come to a contemporary theological discourse, which at the same time can claim contextual plausibility, contextual relevance, and theological legitimacy, theological validity. Okay. Um, because of the process of secularization and pluralization, the situation of Christian faith, and thus also of the church, has thoroughly changed in Europe, was the first step of my initial analysis. Theology's credibility and relevance, which shared in the self-evident character of the Christian horizon of meaning, came under pressure when this unquestionability fell away. Theology has lost its traditional, relatively central place in each of the three domains of university, church, and culture and society. In reaction to this marginalization, theology often employed strategies to escape the margin in one domain with consequences for its place in the other domains. Also, when theology repositioned itself in one domain, this usually had an immediate impact on its role and place in the other domains. At the university, theology's place as first among the academic disciplines was either already abolished long ago or reduced almost completely to mere tradition. In the procession, the academic procession in Leuven, the theologians can have the first place. Okay, but that's, that's about it. Yeah. Of course, this loss of prestige is related to the changed place of Christian faith in our society and with the rise, even within Catholic universities, of a post-Christian, soft secularist default position, sometimes radicalized by an empirical scientific positivism. To the extent that theology explicitly situates its assignment from within the tr Christian tradition, thus living up to its theological finality, it fits less and less in the contemporary university framework. Moreover, in a time of religious pluralization, theology would seem to cling on too tightly to only one tradition, anchored in only one faith community, which has become a minority. In the countries surrounding Belgium, this marginalization has inspired theologians to re relativize the theological finality of their disciplines. As a result, theological faculties molded themselves into religious studies departments and, in increasing measure, designed themselves for empirical, historical, literary, philosophical, anthropological research that is no longer motivated from the theological adagio of faith-seeking understanding. In so doing, theology's marginalization by the university led to theology's retreat within the university, redesigning its disciplines as religious studies. As far as theology's place in the church was concerned, my observations back then led me to the conclusion that theology suffered from a church which all too often reacted very defensively against the changing developments in the surrounding culture and society. In the post-conciliar period, the dialogical openness gained at Vatican II had been replaced by an oppositional cramp. Building a front against the evil outside world, however, has a consequence. Those who threaten to disturb the unity within constitute a real danger. In such a church, which no longer felt understood in the contemporary context, theologians who deliberately engaged in dialogue with the then current modern, postmodern context, and from that conversation posed critical questions, were met with suspicion. At least up until 2013, the magisterium has held the scope of theology in the Catholic Church under scrutiny. And theology, theology's fundamental and functional subordination to the church has been strongly emphasized. This has been accompanied by statements, regulations, and condemnations which betray a distrust in theology. Along with the fact that such measures certainly did not contribute 
to theology's credibility in the university, they also weakened theology's ecclesial role. Theologians started to censure themselves, focused only on education or pastoral affairs, became the institution's mouthpieces, and forgot the scientific character of their enterprise. Or they pulled themselves completely out of the church in order to pursue religious studies. In both situations, with a retreat into the church, as well as an exodus out of the church, theologians no longer involve themselves in theology's specific critical productive task, to examine the faith understanding of God's people in the world of today. Also, in society, theologians shared in the Christian faith's loss of relevance and credibility, and, and therefore were often no longer regarded as public intellectuals or academic experts. In fact, they were particularized because they spoke on behalf of Christian faith in a secularized society, or because they only spoke about Christian faith in a religiously pluralized society. In a society that assumed a quasi-neutrality in the public sphere, and combined this with a passive tolerance for religious pluralism in the private sphere, and at the same time a church which often opposed itself to such a society, there remained hardly any room for a theology whose program is a scientifically founded dialogue between faith and context. Once again, I observed a twofold response to this marginalization. On the one hand, theologians retreated from the dialogue with society, either within the ivory towers of scientific research or within the safe cocoon of mere service to the church and its self-legitimation. On the other hand, and contrary to this first move, some theologians withdrew into society and focused, for example, on the apparent polymorphous but often market-driven post-Christian and post-secular search for spirituality and meaning, and or became advocates of a post-Christian, soft-secularist, religion-friendly pluralism. In both cases, theology renounced its critical constructive assignment to guide communities and individuals in their search for identity, preventing them from falling into the all-too-easy extremes of fundamentalism and ethnocentrism, or relativism and consumerism. This brings me to my second step. Based on these initial observations, I uh, presented, I will, step one is so theology loses its critical productive role in each of the domains when it tries to escape its marginalizations. I think my examples uh, made this clear. This brought me to the formulation of a thesis in three steps. And the first step is, it belongs to the assignment of theology to be active in all three domains. In particular, to be involved what is at stake in these three domains, the scientific search for truth and knowledge in the university, developing a contemporary faith understanding and faith life in the church, and thirdly, coming to an individual and communal identity in a post-Christian and post-secular society. It belongs to theology's nature to involve itself in all three domains, especially where they meet, at the cross notes, where they overlap and touch each other. Theology belongs to each of them without being able to be reduced to any one of them. Second step, because of the above mentioned shifts in each of these domains, theology's position shifts from the center to the margin. Theology must guard against reacting to this marginalization by either retreating out of a domain or moving exclusively inside one of the domains. Rather than abandoning the crossroads, it should learn to re-examine its place and contribution precisely from the margin in each of the domains. What originally might be considered a loss, marginalization, then may become an opportunity. And third step in the thesis. Thus, theology is called to keep the tension precisely where it sits entangled between the domains and not allow itself to be tempted by easy answers. This is exactly its contemporary recontextualized assignment. 
With respect to the university, church, and society, it can make a contextually relevant and theologically credible contribution precisely from its difficult place in the margin and at the crossroads with each of these domains. This thesis, which I formulated about 10, 15 years ago, is based on the theological conviction that theology lives from such attention. Involved in history, it should enter into a dialogue with what happens, with what is taught, with how people live. It should do so precisely because of the dialogical concept of revelation developed by Vatican II in Dei Verbum. A God which allows God's self to be known in encounters with people in creation and in history will also only allow God's self to be known dialogically today and in the future. Moreover, the fact that this dialogue will need to be carried out from the margins in our days may be more of an advantage than a disadvantage. So, an intermediary evaluation. We are 10, 15 years later. A theology of recontextualization is itself implied in recontextualization. Also, the place from which theology speaks, its self-perception, how theology proceeds, and the way in which it presents itself in the university, church, and society are subject to recontextualization. When the context in which theology is done shifts, theology itself is also pressed to recontextualize. As far as I'm concerned, reconsidering the place from which it speaks and the way in which it speaks should not be seen as a threat for the cause of theology, but as an opportunity to regain contextual relevance, plausibility, theological legitimacy, and validity. The analysis presented here that theology has shifted to the margin of the three domains in which it is involved still holds, I would claim. Furthermore, the developments causing this shift have not disappeared. At the same time, it is no longer only the feeling of loss and threat that has been governing the theological world, but to a growing degree also a sense that new opportunities offer themselves. Not by leaving the difficult place where theology finds itself by, but by self-consciously assuming it. There are definitely evolutions in the academy and society which can be considered as contributing to such a shift. But in my opinion, it is especially the evolution within the church which has offered theologians more room to engage from the margin and on the crossroads what is at stake in the university, the church, and culture and society. More specifically, the papacy of Pope Francis has brought about a renewed link to the dialogical spirit of Vatican II. And the shift from a self-centered church, oppositional to the world, to a critically constructive, world-oriented church. It's no exaggeration to say that this evolution within the church reflects positively on the discipline of theology and the place of theology and theologians in the three domains. As already mentioned, it did not fundamentally change the place in which theology finds itself. But it makes, I would claim it, more easy for theologians to seize the opportunities of that place. As a result, the rediscovery of Vatican II's dialogical concept of, re of revelation, not only dogmatically developed in Deo Verbum, but also practiced in many of the other conciliar documents, offers the fundamental framework for a theology which seeks to self-consciously recontextualize itself in dialogue with what is at stake at the university within the church and in culture and society. It's only fair to mention at this point, and I think you discussed the document yesterday evening, that the, the document Theology Today, issued by 2012 by the International Theological Commission, just one year before the election of Pope Francis, or already created more room for theology. For the sake of theology itself, the document says, theologians, from their commitment to scripture, tradition, the magisterium, and in conversation with their colleagues worldwide, should engage in the dialogue with the world as a locus for theology, and thereby, thereby recognize the sensus fidelium as a source for theological reflection. It should be said, 
The majority of Catholic theologians consider much of what theology today says as already achieved. But more than any other official statement at the time, documents assumed an appreciation for and trust in theology, even though traces to the contrary are still present in that document. However, what this document underestimates is the effect of the dialogue with the world on theology. Theology Today portrays this dialogue as one of the six fundamental reference points or constitutive interactions, eh? logi theologici, theology is involved in scripture, tradition, the sensus fidelium, the magisterium, the company of Catholic theologians, and the world. <laughs> Regarding the latter, the document mentions that theology is, and I quote, in constant dialogue with the world, and I quote again, should help the church to read the signs of the times in light of the gospel, uh, number 58. In no way would I want to downplay the other five constitutive interactions. But when one accepts the dialogue with the world as a constitutive interaction, then that changes everything. The dialogue with the world is not simply a locus, but rather determines the background in which theology involves itself with the other loci, in its reflection upon God's revelation in creation and history. It is the dialogue with the world which is responsible for the difference and plurality in theology. It is the dialogue with the world which prevents the church from becoming self-centered and defensive and opens it up to new developments and challenges. It is the dialogue with the world which enables us to read and rediscover our theological sources with different eyes. In other words, it is the dialogue with the world which urges us to constant recontextualization. So, speaking boldly from the margins on the crossroads, in my initial analysis, I also pointed to some opportunities of speaking from the margins and on the crossroads. In what follows, I briefly, briefly evaluate these in light of the current situation and highlight some new developments. As to the university, I argued at the time that the more pragmatic self-understanding of science, seeking its legitimation through its performativity, paradoxically also helps theology to argue for its own place at the university. Interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary quality assessments often include formal criteria, ranking reviews and other scientific output and lists, counting publications and citations, measuring acquired research funding, estimating the amount of research project and PhDs accomplished, and so on. Of course, a lot of academics and institutions are aware of the risks of far too quantitative approaches to measuring quality, and have developed procedures to complement quantitative assessment with qualitative evaluation. At the same time, for theology, such approach offers the opportunity to meet the university's standards by complying to these formal academic standards. As an, acad as an academic domain, theology and the variety of its disciplines has many peer-reviewed journals and book series, doctoral output, and international research network networks. For me, however, there is a more fundamental intuition at work in all of this. Also today, I'm convinced that only when theology is able to justify its place in the university according to the criteria of the university itself, will it be able to safeguard its place in the academy. Even more so, only when theology is fully academic and recognized as such, can it assist the university to live up to its assignment, fostering the university's self-critical consciousness by pointing to the limits of academic methodologies and discourses, warning against reductionisms, pointing out ethical issues and questions which involve the search for meaning. At the same time, theology should be watchful when the contemporary grand narratives of performativity and economic applicability colonize the scientific dynamic at the detriment of the appeal of the idol of universitas. In that regard, the transdisciplinary dynamics which 
try to overcome the pitfalls of specialization, of over-specialization, by embedding the latter in broader research frameworks, facilitating multidisciplinary perspectives and collaboration, offer new possibilities for theology to contribute to transversal research teams such as peace, sustainability, health, identity politics and difference, education, ethics and science, and so on. Finally, it would seem that the harsh discussions between theology and religious studies have been softened, or at least are perceived by many, not by all, but by many, as outdated. First of all, the attempts in neighboring countries to make the study of religion attractive by turning theological faculties into faculties of religious studies has failed. In the Netherlands, for instance, all of these institutes for religious studies, in the meantime, have been integrated in larger faculties of humanities and almost completely disappeared. Secondly, the shift from a secularization paradigm to a pluralization paradigm has had two consequences in interpreting the contemporary religious situation in Europe. First of all, the secularizing agenda of many of these initiatives to change theology into religious studies has become much more visible. And the quasi imperative dy dynamic stemming from the secularization thesis has been questioned, yeah, as if the shift from theology to religious studies would be inescapable. At the same time, the recognition of plurality and difference also allows for an approach that appreciates the particularity of religious traditions, among others in interreligious conversations, and does also to the theological finality of theological disciplines. This is to say, for theological approaches which, respecting the plurality and differences encountered, succeed in dialoguing with other disciplines and religions or worldviews. As far as I'm concerned, it's only such a theology which will be able to also contribute from the crossroads to the two other domains to which it belongs. I mentioned already that the election of Pope Francis to the Holy See has changed a lot in the self-perception of the church vis-a-vis -vis the world, and as also regards theology. As a matter of fact, I, I have already participated in many, many theological conferences. But this is the first conference in which, in all of the talks I heard, a pope was mentioned. Positively, <laughs> positively. Yeah. So, so something has changed. Eh? Yeah. And it was the same pope. <laughs> yeah. One cannot say that Pope Francis explicitly has put theology at the center of the church. But at least the curtailing and disciplining of theology in function of the church's self-legitimation in opposition to the world has ended. At the same time, the reasons for self-censorship and the withdrawal of theology into only teaching and pastor work have fallen away. Emblematic for this situation is the altered status of the congregation for the doctrine of the faith. Since we uh, read Predicate Evangelium, uh, we know that it is not the first congregation anymore, but the so the dicastery for evangelization is the first. Uh? So this is, yeah, it, this is emblematic for, for a new situation. Uh? Also remarkable is the fact that also its operations changed since uh, 2013. Um, perhaps also due to its other assignments, because they are also in charge of sexual abuse in the church. Uh? But in comparison with the years up until 2012, no major documents, new regulations, doctrinal notes, nor any notification on the work of individual theologians have been issued by this congregation. You just go to the Vatican's website, look Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith documents, up until 2012 you find notifications on Sobrino, on Dupuis, on, uh, not on Sobrino, on, uh, yeah, on Sobrino, on, on Dupuis and so on. From 2012 on, not any notification anymore on an individual theologian. Huh? In short, one could conclude that the formal mar marginalization of theology within the church has ended, and so too some of its effects on the place of theology and the legitimation there thereof in the university and in society. 
Francis' call for dialogue with the world is framed within an original evangelizing drive. And both dialogue and mission are to be seen as one fundamental dynamic. It's not so that dialogue is an instrument to evangelize, nor that mission is a supplement to a prior dialogue. Dialogue, moreover, involves a mutual learning process, which urges the church to both authentic self-criticism and prophetic criticism to the world, of the world. Both go together. Only a church which is able to engage in self-critical discernment, reading the signs of the times in light of the gospel, will be able to address the world on account of that same gospel. In other words, only a church which sees and seeks its own dialogical conversion to the world can in its turn authentically call the world to conversion. And being at the margin, in Francis' words, going out to the periphery is hardly a bad location to engage in this mutual learning process. This reframing of the assignment of the church self-evidently fosters a conception of theology in dialogue with other disciplines, worldviews, and religions on major themes which concern culture and society. In other words, it fosters a theology which conceives itself from, from within a dynamic of recontextualization. Also in culture and society, a church which is not primarily perceived as a moralizing and condemning relic of the past, but which approaches the world positively, inviting it to work together for a new humanism, anchored in a preferential option for the poor, makes a difference. Here as well, only a church which itself takes on its responsibility can call the world to do so as well in matters of climate change, migration, meaning, and so on. As a matter of fact, quite some theologians contribute to these discussions, as well as to the church's own synodal process of self-critical discernment. In my conclusions about a decade ago, I argued that it was urgent to overcome the classical oppositions which paralyzed church and theology for too long. Progressive, conservative, modern, vis-a-vis pre-modern, post-modern, correlational, anti-correlational, aggiornamento, ressourcement, and connected to that the discussion about the real and authentic reception of Vatican II. Did the Council bring about a refreshing newness with its call for aggiornamento, or should it be understood first and foremost in continuity with the past? In my own theological approach, I advocated for a way beyond mere continuity and discontinuity, understanding the relation between church and world, past and future, by combining both of these dichotomies within the notion of interruption. Precisely when the church thinks it must close itself off from history to save God's revelation, it loses the possibility to track down this revelation today. Because God, perhaps, reveals God's self precisely where narratives are interrupted, where otherness challenges fixed frameworks and where difference is not wrapped out but can come to speak. A church which understands itself fundamentally as dialogically, as a critical constructive partner with and in the world, involved in mutual learning processes, requires a theology which seizes this opportunity and moreover, a theology which is extremely self-aware of the place from which it finds itself in culture and society. It is a theology which engages itself fully in the mutual learning process which a missionary dialogue with the world intrinsically involves. <clears throat> Such a theology, I would claim, is able to fundamentally differentiate between the processes of detraditionalization, individualiz individualization, and pluralization, which have changed our society, uh, the isations, on the one hand, and the reactions to these processes, the isms, on the other. Both nihilism and secularism are reactions to detraditionalization in the same vein as the opposite reactions of neo-traditionalism and religious fundamentalism. The same holds true for individualism and consumerism as possible reactions to individualization. And pluralization comes along with reactions to it, ranging from relativism over pluralism up to ethnocentrism and racism. 
all identity formation, including Christian identity formation, is challenged to deal with the insecurity of a context marked by these three processes. Mentioned, by these three processes mentioned. And with the polarization, the reactions to these bring along. Identity today is formed in a context which, in a catchier way, is characterized as VUCA. Vol volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. The COVID-19 crisis only added to this VUCA characterization. Theology here has its role to play in preventing Christian identity formation from falling back, either into fundamentalism and ethnocentrism, or into a kind of soft Christian and even soft secularist or soft pluralist positions. The combination of soft secularism and soft pluralism seems, as I wrote 10 years ago, to have become society's mainstream default position. This position makes two claims, too quickly and too self-evidently. First, that the public domain is ideologically neutral and that religion is thus a private matter. And second, that no matter how different religions and philosophical orientations are, they ultimately come down to the same thing. Whoever does not respect this double claim is then a fanatic or extremist who disturbs this reasonable consensus. It is theology's assignment to interrupt such a complacent self-understanding and to criticize the presuppositions of the soft secularist and soft pluralist default position. Only then does theology help our society evolve from a passive tolerant society in which difference is well accepted so long as it does not really matter and does not break up the soft consensus into a society which really al allows for and engages pluralism. Only then will religious and other philosophical traditions be able to offer resistance from their own resources against the economic hegemonic narrative, which has all too easily taken the vacated place in the public forum and which reduces life and society to market thinking. Today, I think this analysis still stands. In this regard, it is striking that especially the oft fraught relationship with Islam both challenges and nurtures such soft secularist and pluralist positions, as well as it fuels polarization and conflict. At the same time, on the level of culture and society, notwithstanding the growing polarization and conflicts, questions asking to know a more, uh, sorry, I, at the same time, on the level of culture and society, notwithstanding the growing polarization and conflicts, questions asking to know more about religion or opportunities for theologians to bring in the religious dimension where it tends to be forgotten pop up. In recent journalism about the war in Ukraine, for instance, the religious background of the conflict hardly surfaced, which offered the opportunity for theologians in Flanders to address this issue and to point to the in intricate relationship of Russian orthodoxy to Kiev and Ukraine on the one hand and the conflictual foundation of the U Ukrainian Orthodox Patriarchy, recognized by the Patriarchy of Constantinople on the other. As regards our VUCA society, which seems to be grasped by soft secularism and polarization at the same time, it falls to theology to consider the role of Christian faith in attempting to construct a new post-traditional kind of consensus, which enables a combination of identity and difference respect for plurality, and the search for commonality. In considering this issue, I have been intrigued by Johann Baptist Metz's oft-mentioned consideration of the Böckeforde paradox. According to the German philosopher of law, Ernst Wolfgang Böckeforde, modern democracy is sustained by assumptions and values which are neither created nor guaranteed by it. By making essentially everything subject to the will of the majority, a democratic society can even end up willing its own self-destruction, which is exactly what happened in Germany during the 1930s. Of itself, democracy doesn't simply and naturally lead to more democracy. Instead, 
In order to sustain its basic values and assumptions, democracy makes an appeal to resources available in the fundamental beliefs and values of the individuals and social groups participating in it. For Metz, the latter opened up a space where religious traditions, particularly their dangerous memories and histories of suffering, could be retrieved as necessary sources of meaning for people living in post-traditional democratic societies. As far as I'm concerned, this is the project I am furthering for Catholic education in Flanders. The project of the Catholic Dialogue School. Based on a theology which fundamentally conceives of God and revelation in, in terms of dialogue, this project invites everyone at school, Christians and non-Christians alike, and I told you there are lots of non-Christians or post-Christians, or to engage in a common search for identity. Mutual dialogue with the other urges both respect for the other and self-clarification in the individual and social construction of identity. Dialogue not only leads one gaining more knowledge about and appreciation for the other, rather first and foremost, it enables one to discover and then articulate one's own horizon of meaning and significance. This pedagogical project intends to be no, no less Catholic as was the obvious confessionalism of our schools at a time when almost everybody was self-evidently Catholic in the 1950s. And likewise, the project is no less Catholic than the project of the Christian values education in the second half of last century, when Catholic schools were looking for their place and role in a modern secularizing society and sought for a kind of, you could say, joint venture between modern human values and Christian values. On the contrary, it is precisely because our schools intend to be Catholic today that they are open to the other and enter into dialogue. A choice for dialogue, therefore, is not a neutral one. Each dialogue partner brings his or her story, questions and beliefs and invites the other to share them. Even more, it is precisely within this dialogue that the Christian voice can sound and may contribute to the search of identity of, of all at school, Christians and non-Christians alike. And this with a new kind of freshness. It is telling, given the tenor of my contribution today, that the recent instruction of the Congregation for Catholic Education, by its title alone, embraces this dialogical impetus. And I quote the title, the identity of the Catholic school for a culture of dialogue. Moreover, it strongly confirms this impetus on theological grounds in its foundational paragraph 30. And I quote the paragraph, or part of the paragraph, the church considers dialogue as a constitutive dimension, as she is rooted precisely in the Trinitarian dynamics of dialogue, in the dialogue between God and human beings, and in the dialogue among human beings themselves. Because of its ecclesial nature, the Catholic school shares this element as constitutive of its identity. It must therefore practice the grammar of dialogue, not as a technical expedient, but as a profound way of relating to others." End of quote. So in my contribution, I rehearsed and evaluated the analysis I made more than 10, 15 years ago. The main trend of my analysis and conclusion still stands. Theology's location remains at the margins of university, church, and society. And more precisely, on the crossroads where these three domains intersect. And if it wants to remain theology with its theological finality, it should stay there on those crossroads. At the same time, because of evolutions in both university and society, but especially in the church, the opportunities of such location may have become more visible and engagement with it much more supported from within the domains concerned. At the same time, the challenge to recontextualize theology in dialogue with the contemporary context is more pressing than ever. Because only a faith, only a Christian faith, a church, a theology, which converts itself constantly to the dialogue with the world, will be able of calling the world to conversion. 
Thank you.